Hello, and welcome to the SharePoint Framework and JavaScript Special Interest Group Bi-Weekly Sync. It is February 14th, 2019, and very excited uh, for our meeting here today, and thank you all, thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, for those of you that might be new to the call or new to listening to the uh, recordings or watching the videos, uh, this is a little bit about what this call is all about and how we got started. So we're part of the larger SharePoint Patterns and Practices program, and we originally had one monthly call that just uh, wasn't enough to cover everything uh, we wanted to cover in a single call, and it definitely didn't give us the opportunity to dive down uh, into various topics as much as uh, we would like to and as much as uh, folks out there uh, in the community would like would uh, were asking for. So we started uh, this series of special interest group calls on alternating weeks. And so uh, every other week you can come to this call, which is the uh, SharePoint Framework and JavaScript special interest group call. Um, and then on the other weeks is the uh, Seesaw PowerShell uh, sort of managed code uh, special interest group. So attend, obviously, uh, both or all of the calls. We, of course, uh, encourage that. But they do give you a little bit more focus on the different topic areas. For example, in this one, we do an open discussion and updates around the latest with SharePoint framework, what's new there, what's on the roadmap. Uh, we then go over updates around the PNPJS uh, components, the Office CLI, the reusable controls, and as well as the community-supported Yeoman Generator, which is the newest addition to our stable of uh, PNP-produced uh, SharePoint framework-related resources. And uh, as well, uh, which I don't really know how to squeeze it into this, we do demos, of course, on this call, which I think are always uh, one of the best parts of the call. Two links down there at the bottom, aka.msspnp-community, and the second link there, spdev-docs. The first will take you to the Microsoft tech community, specifically the SharePoint section of the tech community. That's a great place to ask general questions, um, get advice, questions around how would I design, how would you architect, things that aren't maybe specific to any of the one li uh, any of the libraries or any of uh, you know SharePoint framework uh, in particular. So those broader kind of questions uh, or things that aren't really bugs or issues with a particular library. Great place to ask those. A lot of awesome community involvement there. And the second link, spdev-docs, takes you to all of the SharePoint developer documentation. So if you're new to SharePoint Framework, looking to get started and walk through the tutorials there, uh, that's the appropriate place to check that out. And then as well, if uh, you're looking for the resources around uh, uh, package solution development, so WSPs, um, CSOM development, any of the other SharePoint development technologies we are moving and, or have moved, all of our content there. So if you see stuff missing, uh, of course, appreciate the feedback uh, from everyone, and it really helps us uh, drive and ensure we've got the right content and the updated content that everybody needs uh, to do their development uh, tasks day to day. So moving on, what is our agenda for today? We have an engineering update, uh, of course, on SharePoint Framework. Then we've got the Patterns and Practices program updates for PNPJS, the CLI, the Reusable Controls, and the Yeoman Generator. And we've got two great demos uh, as well, again, from the community. So Eric Overfield with an RSS web part and Luis Manez with a single part uh, app page extension. So another very cool demo. And I'll keep saying, uh, really, enjoy the demos, and I think uh, one of the better parts of this call. And then we'll have a Q&A. But first, we just wanted to say from all of us at Patterns and Practices to all of you out there in the community, happy Valentine's Day. So we appreciate all of you. We just wanted to say thank you. Um, we really appreciate uh, everybody joining the call. And uh, just it really means a lot to us that all of you are part of our community and help us uh, make this go every day. So really appreciate you. But happy Valentine's Day from all of us to all of you out there. So if you're looking for opportunities to participate in the PNP, um, this is not necessarily specific to the uh, SharePoint Framework JavaScript Special Interest Group call, but uh, you know the whole the whole Patterns and Practices program all up. So you can always do a demo of the SharePoint Framework stuff or anything in the at PNP uh, space. So that's the uh, PNPJS, the CLI, the Reusable Controls, the Yeoman Generator. 
Um, you can always contribute on GitHub, so you can report any issues, submit pull requests, definitely help with issues and questions. Uh, we really appreciate that from the community. And then, as always, uh, always appreciate your feedback. Um, how are the calls going? Are there documentation needs? Where else, where else can we help? Um, just a note on the feedback, we are... Uh, you know, all individuals with other responsibilities. So we appreciate your feedback and we do our best to respond to your feedback, but it's not something we can always immediately uh, implement or do or change. So uh, a lot of the times, if you have uh, feedback and you have a little bit of time, uh, a great way to contribute is to uh, submit a pull request or help update documentation and things like that. We very much appreciate it, and sometimes uh, that's the quickest way to get little updates made. But uh, do always appreciate the feedback, appreciate the help from everybody out there in the community. So now, Vesa, updates on SharePoint Framework. I'm taking over the slides so uh, for a few slides. So quick updates from here. You basically already went through this slide, so I'm not going to spend uh, just a second in here. Just a game SSP dev docs for the documentation and then videos where the recordings are uh, in 24 hours, typically after the calls, and then the SP dev issue list. Just a reminders on those. Now, um, a reminder on the training material. So please do remember we have an existing package of training material available for you. So if you're new on a SharePoint framework and you're looking into learning how to get started, uh, we have videos, we have uh, hands-on labs, and we have demos. So if you are actually a trainer and you want to re-deliver to the, the SharePoint getting started on SharePoint framework in your local training company or for your team members, you can absolutely do so as well. So all of the material is given uh, for free and you can use it anywhere way you want. Uh, so uh, please take advantage of this one. We're looking into having three additional modules uh, in this quarter still. And those will be concentrating, for example, the Teams, uh, team, Microsoft Teams development using SPFX and a few other options. So, um, And also give us feedback around this uh, training material so we can, we know is it good enough? Is something missing? What should be involved, uh, improved in there? Right now, that link goes to an announcement blog post. We're looking into creating an actual page uh, in the SharePoint Dev portal as well. Uh, so you can easily always access that. But if you use the AKMS SPFX training, it will be updated uh, in the future as well. The second thing what I wanted to, and this is kind of a typical slide, uh, just to pinpoint uh, the growth of SharePoint Framework. And you can see that uh, that's actually showing the latest numbers from this week as well, so Monday to Tuesday. And Wednesday numbers are in. Uh, I will need to go back and update some uh, days with some missing the number, but we can see the, the tremendous growth uh, on the SharePoint framework usage in SharePoint Online, uh, and it is basically every single Monday is uh, doing always the new record uh, on the amount of people using SharePoint framework and also the amount of tenants using SharePoint framework uh, in, in SharePoint Online. So if you're kind of still in between or you might be in SharePoint and in developer, um, we would highly recommend them moving uh, on a SharePoint framework uh, platform. Uh, people are using it and other people are implementing stuff on top of it. Um, it is by far the most widely used customization model in Office 365. Now, a uh, quick update on the on the SharePoint developer roadmap from a SharePoint framework perspective. Uh, nothing too much changes in here. Uh, I did uh, add some additional clarity on, on the topics. Uh, 1.8 uh, is coming out uh, in this quarter. Uh, we did actually, we haven't published any actual date. Uh, I, can, I can say that uh, you do not know the original date, but we were forced to delay the release for one week, uh, so we're getting aligned together with Microsoft Teams. Uh, but we're getting there. Uh, it is still a matter of, uh, how would I put it, uh, uh, weeks, uh, rather than within an upcoming days when the 1.8 is, is actually happening. So, But it's coming quite soon, and that has then the general availability for Microsoft Teams development with SharePoint Framework, which will be the number one topic there. Also, we'll have uh, general availability for single part app pages. I'm going to talk about that one slightly uh, in the upcoming slides. And provider hosted solutions in SharePoint and a few other things as well. Now, uh, the SharePoint Framework library package support for third-party developers uh, is most likely in 1.8. We're currently testing that, trying to make sure that it's, it's working properly, that there's no surprises. So that would be highly beneficial, and that is a constant ask in the user voice as well uh, for us to deliver. If it's not in 1.8, it will be in 1.9. Now, so nothing too traumatical uh, from that perspective, but just updating you that things are moving. Now. 
oh, I had some animations here, so I'm going to actually do the, uh, all of this. Animations are slightly broken, so let me actually explain this. So this is something what I was planning to do actually even as a live demo, but uh, we just decided to change the UI uh, from an end user perspective this week. Uh, so basically, even though it was functioning, uh, we will change the UI and, and I can't show you that because our eDoc is currently programmed from this perspective. Now, but what this one uh, slide is trying to explain is around the single part app page behavior and how this will work actually in uh, in the GA or general availability release. So as part of the 1.8. Um, as part of the 1.7 released a single page application, uh, uh, single part application page support, um, but you needed to actually use code to switch an existing content page to be a single part app page. Um, as part of 1.8 and as part of the evolution of the modern pages, we will actually start supporting by defining the supported hosts for your web part. And this is actually a really exciting, uh, exciting feature because you can decide which of the web parts in codes, web parts, or whatever we call them, the components in your solution will be then exposed as SharePoint web part, or will they be exposed as SharePoint full page applications, uh, single part applications, or will they be exposed as a Teams tabs? And obviously you can select any of these or all of them uh, as an option. And, and what it actually means is that um, uh, if you choose just SharePoint web part, it means that the web part which has been the solution, oh, sorry, the web part which is inside of the solution or the component inside of the solution is exposed as a SharePoint web part. If you choose the SharePoint full page, it means that when somebody from end user goes and creates a new page, in the user interface, clicks to create a new page functionality. Um, we will actually give you uh, the predefined full page uh, applications or add-ins to choose from. So the end user can then see that, okay, I have a, um, a component uh, available called, what could it be? Uh, ELO line of business application, in the, uh, line of business uh, integration component. And I can select that one as a new page to the site. And that will have a pre-configured web part, or we can actually expose some of the properties from that web part or well, component, uh, which the end user can still configure uh, when the page is getting created. So, uh, and the, the SharePoint full page option, here uh, basically is also the one where the actual end user cannot then get rid of the web part. So basically uh, you can't close the web part because it's a single part web app page. Uh, it is taking the whole full uh, size of the of the page and it, and, and uh, it has a slightly different behavior than a classic web part. Then the third option here uh, is that you're able to say that supported host is Teams and that will then mean that the, the web part, well, the component is being exposed as a Microsoft Teams tab uh, through the Microsoft Teams as well. So uh, like I said, you can uh, then absolutely do these options. Uh, uh, you can mix and match the options as well. Uh, there's a question uh, from Tommy related on uh, SBA functionality available for classic experiences. Answer is no. Uh, the SBA or the SharePoint full page app, app option is only available in the in the modern experiences. Uh, so the web part option is available in the classic as well. The full page option is only available in the modern experiences because it's 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 basically built on top of the modern uh, upcoming modern page layout selection functionality, which is coming relatively soon as a functionality for SharePoint as well. Um, yeah, so only modern for that option. Now, um, I think that's a high level picture. I can't, like I said, I can't do a live demo on this one. Unfortunately, in this call, I will do a live demo on the next one. Uh, so uh, we'll, we can see how it will be looking uh, for a end users uh, at that point when, when the GA will happen. Um, and we will have a demo from Luis Manes uh, in this call, later this call, uh, to actually talk about the single part web page um, in, in practice. What does it mean? And I can then explain what, how it will be exposed uh, whenever the GA is available. Good. I think I had one more or a few more pages. Uh, this is a super new thing. Uh, so um, I got a request last night from Visual Studio people. Uh, we are moving uh, to uh, uh, well a new uh, Windows Identity Foundation uh, related on SharePoint for what hosted add-ins. So even though this is SPFX call, if you also have provider hosted add-ins, we would ask you to um, help us basically uh, to test the Visual Studio 2019 as there is a new token helper which is using the Windows Identity Foundation 4.5. Um, 
and uh, the Visual Studio 2019 is going to have that one uh, included in the GA version of Visual Studio 2019, which is a plan to happen relatively soon. So um, if you have um, uh, existing solutions or property hosted add-ins, we would love to get your input uh, related on uh, is it working, are, are you having problems uh, and all of that. Obviously, we will, we are having testers and testing plan for this one as well, but getting the field to provide us the input is super important as well uh, before it will be released. So even though this SharePoint framework call, if you have an option to talk about and do some testing on here, please let us know uh, and report any findings in the AKMS SPDF issue list. Um, and you can use VS 2019 as the prefix as an example there. So we'll spot them more easily. Good. Um, now, uh, one more slide and a kind of a discussion point because I, I noticed Hugo uh, is on the on the call as well. And this is something which we've been um, having a, a long lasting discussions uh, in the in the PMP and, and the SharePoint engineering as well. Now, we're, we're obviously building all of different kind of portals and different kind of functionalities. So one of the things what we want to make sure is that you as a community member, if you share your samples in a GitHub, you would actually get exposure for your sample and for yourself in a sufficient way. Um, and the, because that the whole system of the open source and, and the community works in a way that you need to get some value out of sharing your knowledge, because otherwise people would not actually do that. Um, so what we're trying to do, and this is something which we've been planning for a while, and then we put it in hold, and then we were thinking about it, and then we put it in hold, is that should we actually create a sample portal explicitly for SharePoint framework components? Well, maybe in the future that could actually hold, hold samples for Microsoft Graph and Office add-ins as well. Um, and then, thank you, Hugo. And then uh, people like, uh, or you can actually submit, uh, most likely using a GitHub channel, you would actually submit a, a additional metadata for your sample and the reference to the sample, like the image and the attributes and metadata. And then all of that is automatically getting exposed to using a nice UI uh, in, the, in the internet side. The question is really, obviously this wouldn't be a store. So the SharePoint Framework store support is coming. So that's in the roadmap and we're active working on it. This would be more for getting exposure for the samples and open source solutions, what people are actually building. So they're not getting uh, lost in a GitHub uh, because right now your awesome, awesome, awesome web part implementation might actually get lost because there's so many samples available. So using this kind of a, a, a portal would then then um, expose those samples potentially much more easily for the for the people, and we could expose the search functionality categories, uh, business categories, ratings, potentially comments and views, and then do uh, some level of a ranking uh, between the samples as well. Um, and obviously, I, I do understand that when we ask the question on, hey, do you want to have a cool portal which will help you? The answer is obviously yes. Um, the question is more on, uh, over, if we start implementing this, it will be an open source portal. Uh, it will be something which everybody can get access from a search code perspective. It will take a while actually to do that. Um, and most likely it will mean that uh, some of the, um, the people who are really active in the community and, and helping uh, will need to start dedicating time on making this happen. But if it's really seen as worthwhile, um, and we, we absolutely need to uh, make this happen for you. And I can see Hugo's comment uh, already, and, and he's willing to help on the, on the implementation as well. Um, I added there three kind of a, a quick uh, pictures around here. So there's the React Rocks is the one side. So that's for React components, get some exposure. Uh, then there's the triple uh, triple.com, uh, 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 which is uh, which is kind of, that could be the, the example reference case, what are we hunting for? Uh, then there's a really old UI mockup, which I drew while back related on how we could expose uh, these components. Um, there will be a lot of people are actually uh, clearly liking this idea. We'll put it in the in the uh, backlog. Uh, I'll try to figure out if we can uh, find some funding and how do we make this happen, or do we need to do this as a open source community project? But uh, clearly, people are liking the idea of getting more more visibility for the samples which are available. Um, good. I think that's it for now. So for my side, so let's actually move on on Patrick Rogers. Sorry for taking f some time extra, but I think it's fine. All right. 
So we should be back on the PMPJS uh, client library slides. So quick update there. We did release 129 on uh, last Friday, February 8th. Uh, you can always check the change log for uh, what was updated in each version. And as well, it does uh, list who helped out with those changes. So uh, a little bit of visibility for those folks uh, doing the changes. We did, uh, did want to mention 2.6 billion requests through the library to SharePoint Online in the month of January. So really, uh, really fantastic to see that growth. Um, and really appreciate it. And again, that's up to all of you out there using it in your project. So a big thank you uh, for all of you for that. Uh, beta releases continue. Um, those are generally on Fridays, but sometimes or throughout the week. Uh, that's a good way just to see uh, what's coming up and test things out. Um, and then we're starting to think about 2.0. So if you look at the issues list, you'll see a roadmap label, and you can see on those issues are discussions around some of the features uh, that we're going to try and work into 2.0. So appreciate your feedback and discussions uh, there. Do not have a target date yet uh, for that, but uh, I don't know. Usually at the, I don't know, last year at the European Collaboration Summit, I announced stuff, so maybe that would happen again this year. We will see. And thank you, as always, to all our contributors. Uh, very much appreciate uh, everything everybody's doing out there, reporting issues, uh, submitting pull requests, uh, that sort of stuff is all very much appreciated uh, by all of us. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, documentation link there, pnp.github.io slash pnpjs, gets you to all the documentation for the pnpjs libraries. As well, you can follow the hashtag pnpjs on Twitter. Updates for the Office 365 CLI, and I'm going to just mute somebody. I'm trying. I'm trying to do that as well. So, uh, just, I'll, oh, there we go. Okay. So Office 365 CLI, uh, we've got a new beta out, 1.14, with commands for removing users from Teams, adding fields to list views, applying large site designs, and managing dynamic data. And as well, improvements around getting list webhooks, getting flows, and getting files. In progress, of course, more commands. And then... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome, of course, your ideas. So if you have ideas for commands that would help out the CLI, uh, those are always welcome. And the way to kind of do that is to submit an issue to the issues list and say, wouldn't it be neat if we had a command that did X and kind of describe it? And then if you want to work on it, just say, and I'm going to work on this, which would also be great. So you can uh, try that out um, and give that a shot. Uh, and then so why the CLI and not PowerShell? Um, so. And the, uh, the reason I got started is the CLI is cross-platform, where PowerShell is more of a Windows-based uh, solution. You uh, can use the CLI cross-platform, so on a Mac, on a Linux box, uh, wherever. Uh, the idea is as long as you can have a node runtime, you can have the CLI running. So you can do stuff with that uh, in your Docker containers during your uh, testing. You know, if you're using uh, kind of a CLI service or things like that, or a CLI, CI service, uh, something like that. Uh, you know, it's another place this could be helpful. So it's uh, it's it's not a replacement for uh, the PowerShell, of course, uh, but it's just another tool in your toolbox of things to help you with your development life. Uh, the reusable components. Uh, sorry, I'm just. I'm just beside myself with the reusable components. So with the controls React, we've got uh, the 1.12 beta out, and that it has a new control, an iframe panel coming from issue number 226, as well as some enhancements around uh, Russian localization and a taxonomy picker. So updates there to uh, specify term actions. And then we've got uh, some fixes around a couple of bugs in the taxonomy picker and one in the people picker uh, that are in that release. So if you're impacted by any of those bugs, um, please do uh, try out the beta. That might give you uh, a resolution to those bugs uh, there. Uh, contributors do um, want to thank uh, the contributors listed there in alphabetical order. Uh, they've helped out uh, this month or this period uh, on the uh, SPFX controls. And for folks not familiar with the controls, it is two separate packages. Uh, the first uh, represented by the, the first link there is the property controls. And these are controls that work very well in your edit 
pane. So you have your web part, you put into the edit mode, and this is a set of controls since it's such as color pickers, taxonomy uh, pickers, things like that to really help you uh, speed up your SharePoint framework development. And those uh, are already styled with the Office UI fabric, so they're going to blend in nicely with, uh, you know, the out-of-the-box look and give you a nice, clean uh, look uh, to your edit panel. And then the second set of controls are the uh, con controls React. So it's a set of React controls that are used in the body of your web parts to help display information to your users, things like graphs, uh, and maps and things like that. Uh, so it gives you a nice way to both edit your web parts with the property controls and then display the information with the uh, controls React. Um, so uh, two great options there to really speed up and enhance your development. Um, the comment there, show some love for Angular. Uh, would, would love, welcome somebody to jump in and start writing some Angular controls. Uh, I think that'd be fantastic, but I mean, again, we can all only do so much. So, uh, you know, just uh, if you have some time or believe in that Angular controls would be a valuable addition to PNP, absolutely welcome that. I uh, would encourage you to uh, think about starting something like that up. Um, but we do have, uh, so Vase is jumping the gun, uh, but moving over to the Yeoman generator. We've got uh, the SPFX. I think, I think Patrick uh, Stefan is in a call, yeah. so just. No, oh, okay. Well, I'll just stop talking then. <laughs> Stefan. Uh, yeah. Well, we today we released 1.6.2, the new version, uh, and what we did in there, we have better uh, option targeting for the supported platform. So when you create a new project in the default generator, then you will be first ask which framework you are targeting and then which platform, if it is SharePoint Online and SharePoint 2019 or SharePoint 2016. So we flipped this a little bit around, but this gives us better control to actually have a support then, for example, for testing frameworks. And especially with the SharePoint 2016, this SPFX version is pretty old and we cannot do anything in there, so it doesn't make sense to have all the options available. And I updated also the documentation, and you have a feature matrix that actually shows exactly which uh, target platform actually supports what kind of frameworks, what kind of plugins, uh, what kind of testing frameworks, and so on. And there's another thing that we are uh, looking to integrate into the generator in future is that we have an ELM integration, which is currently Vincent Perret uh, working on, and we're also looking into what is currently work in progress to have a more modular Gulp file that it's easier to inject new Gulp tasks for whatever needs we have for testing frameworks, um, Puppeteer, whatever. But uh, that's currently something for the future, which makes the development and the handling of the Yeoman generator way more easy. So uh, to install the latest version, uh, just use npm install minus g at pmp slash generator minus spfx. And for documentation, you can find this on pmp.github.io slash generator slash That's it for my side on the updates so far. All right, and I'm going to try and find somebody who I think is at a farm. I, I think I muted uh, that one, so we should. You got it. All right. Yep. So now uh, moving over to the demos. Uh, Eric, you are up first if you're ready to go, if you want to take over the presentation. Absolutely. Can you all hear me fine? Yes, sir. Excellent. All right. As always, let me know when you all can see my screen. I'm really excited to see if I can see it this week. <laughs> oh, my sharing? gosh, I can. I got it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so quickly, who I am, my name is Eric Overfield, uh, Microsoft Regional Director, Microsoft MVP as well, um, like a, a lot of you who have been contributing as well. Thank you all. Very cool stuff. Uh, I work with Pixel Mill. Uh, got all my information so you can find out who I am, how to get a hold of me, how to get a hold of my company, all that great stuff. All right. Thank you all. So, um, 
basically what I was looking at was this really common request to have that uh, an RSS web part, but it was really flexible. So it was not just asking for an RSS feed and would print it out, but would provide a lot of other options out of the box as well, but then also as part of the PNP side. I really wanted something that had a lot of demo code, a lot of code that did actual uh, extra things that you might want that you could then tear apart and say, wow, that was really cool because I think I, like many of you, I'm taking all those samples out, I'm taking that cool little piece, and I'm, I'm, I'm using it in my project. This, P, uh, this uh, uh, web part was definitely inspired by Oliver Carpenter's uh, uh, RSS Reader web part, part of his uh, 40 Fantastics uh, component that I know that, that Vesta loves so much. Um, there was the, the major issue with that was that it, it was built on SharePoint Framework 1.1, uh, and it hadn't been updated. The other aspect was that the um, the technique that uh, Oliver used to grab the RSS feed was using a Yahoo API that actually got shut down a couple months ago. So we really needed something else to go and grab an RSS feed. So what I wanted to do was not only have just one way to go get a feed as an, uh, using one API, I wanted to be able to get a feed directly. I wanted to use some of the, the new classes available in SharePoint Framework. Um, I wanted to try using other services. Maybe I would want my own proxy service uh, so that I could have something hosted in Azure. I would go, pick, my web part would ping that and then uh, that proxy would go get that, or uh, using a popular paid service. Maybe you're looking that you'd want to use um, something like uh, uh, RSS to JSON, which is a, a service you can pay for that will help be that intermediary for you. Another common request that um, I'm often seeing and that I'm using a lot myself is when I ever need to get external data, um, some from Shim SharePoint, from Graph, from external APIs, et cetera, I would want to store that data in the browser's local storage because maybe it doesn't update very often. Maybe it's uh, a list of news articles, and I want to make sure that every time um, my end users are going to a page on a portal, they don't have to reload from SharePoint and wait those extra couple seconds. We want to store that in their own local storage. But I wanted a really flexible local storage technique that could use, that could basically store any kind of data, um, but that had a, a really good um, hashing algorithm for the local storage key so that if I, had, if I was making a request maybe to a SharePoint list and I wanted to be able to go to multiple pages, I could store the different pages in their own local storage key if I needed to. Uh, so I used, in this case, an MD5 uh, hash of the of some sort of input parameter, maybe the URL. Uh, I know MD5 is not considered um, uh, cryptographically, cryptographically, I suppose, uh, secure. For this particular purpose, I think it's completely fine. It's super fast, super lean and quick, and provides a, a reasonable um, just keying mechanism. Uh, let's see. So the other, the last thing I really wanted to add in here was the ability to um, allow the content, op the editor, the page editor, the user of this web part, to be able to manipulate the uh, the way that the results would get rendered. So this is a huge, uh, big second thanks to uh, whoops, I misspelled Frank. Um, no, I didn't. And uh, Mikhail, um, for the part, the work that they did over in the um, the React uh, Search Refiner for search results web part that uh, recently became a solution, providing those links for y'all if you haven't seen it. Just that is definitely one of the, the uh, cooler web parts that I'm using a lot for uh, clients that I work with because it really makes working with uh, Modern SharePoint and Search great. So I basically took um, their idea of how to work with Handlebar Template. If they got it from someone else, um, please all you know let me know. I, I bet I, that's where I got it from. Some cool stuff. Now when you're Working with um, uh, when you're working with trying to get data from an external site, of course you have to worry about cores as well. So I added a couple ideas of cores there, which is that you could turn the mode on or off so that uh, the browser will or won't send the cores request in the header, um, or as well as using a proxy. And I'll, I'll be able to show all of this kind of quickly in the demo and all the settings. Um, finally. The idea was uh, what I, I started with, which is I really wanted to throw a lot of little things together that I've been using into one web part so that from somewhat selfishly, now I can go grab my code more easily because I've vetted it a little better. But hopefully for you as well, I really hope that a lot of you takes a web part like this and, and sure, it should work fine out of the box. That's the great part. But then as well, you'll rip it apart and you'll see, oh, well, how did he do that? That's an interesting way to do that. And of course, I'm always looking for feedback too. Please, if you think it's way to improve it, let's get those PRs in uh, and let's have a lot of fun with it. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's uh, see this web part in action. Uh, so I had just, of course, the demo page loaded. Uh, once you've got it all in start, installed, it's just going to be your RSS reader web part. 
Um, by default, I've got a bunch of settings set up. And again, this is straight out of Oliver's. I used his demo blog. As I want to give him credit for the cool work that he did. Uh, I just have a lot more settings available, though. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, there's different ways to get the request. So the three that I talked about is a direct request. This would be the browser making a direct request to the end service. Um, the second one is using this feed to JSON. The code itself is always expecting a normalized JSON in order um, to get a, a reliable output, a reliable rendered output. Um, and I have a service to do that within the code base. So, um, but feed to JSON would help you go and pull the, um, uh, you could go to a service and it will return you JSON. What I like about this is this is an open source solution. Uh, they do provide an endpoint that you can ping uh, just for testing, but it's not for production. The catch to that is that they are not sending back the proper cores request, uh, which uh, cores response, which is a real shame. So that actually doesn't work. What you would really want to do is take their open source solution, go put it up in Azure. And uh, you could then ping that. You could ping your own service in production. And then if you are willing to use a paid service, uh, there's this uh, RSS to JSON.com. They offer uh, a free account, which is basically you can make 10,000 requests a day, uh, and they will store your RSS feed for an hour and a half. They'll only refresh it every hour and a half. Uh, but it's pretty cool. I mean, it's nice and simple for a non-production environment. And then they have paid services, which is pretty reasonable. Uh, this, though, is the easy way because it is um, they are sending the proper course response. And uh, this is what I use by default when you first install this thing because it, it was reliable. I could always make sure that we were getting a response. Assuming your corporate firewall doesn't do some weird proxy stuff, I, I haven't been able to test such a scenario. Uh, you can change the maximum count for the direct or feed to, uh, feed to JSON.org. Uh, you cannot change the account for RSS. Uh, to JSON if you, um, unless you're paying for it. Some other cool things. Uh, so I have that caching enabled um, where you can set the timeout as to how long you're going to store something in local storage. Uh, you can change some loading messaging, but then there's also the core's response um, so that you can say, do I want to uh, disable cores? By in default, I'm going to have the core's mode enabled, but I can send, you can send along the, the, the proper um, header message that says, no, no, uh, the header request that just says um, no course, uh, or use the course proxy. So let's go ahead and kind of see some of this in action, though, of course, and I'll show you the next screen in a second. Uh, so let's say I want to make a direct request to my RSS feed, and if I click apply, I'm going to get an error saying that, well, that particular RSS feed is not sending the proper course response, thus it's, thus it's not going to be any good. Even if I disable cores, it's still not going to work because the browser now is saying, I don't like this, this isn't cool. But you can use a course proxy, and I'm using a uh, this course anywhere, um, another open source project that's not really good for production, but but does work. If I go ahead and I apply that, what's happening? What should happen here is uh, what should have happened is the uh, let's just save it, and we will see if it actually loads. This was working before. Maybe my tenant is no longer being responsive. Oh, there we go. Huh. Uh, that was working. I'll make sure it is. Um, I don't know why it's it's not right now where I was using the, um, maybe it didn't uh, save it. Uh, no, it did. Huh. Uh, what, uh, there we go. Let's try request. Let's try apply. Oh, well. Good old demo gods. It doesn't work. Uh, it, it had been working this morning when I tested it before the call, but such is life. Uh, let's go ahead and let's turn all this off. Oh, I think I was disabling core modes. Now let's try it again. There we go. Perfect. Um, now let me try it properly. Perfect. There we go. Uh, I just had a the S office. It's a good bug. There you go. Um, I was disabling cores even though I was trying to use a course proxy. So let's go ahead and turn all that off. Let's go ahead and do one more thing here before I show the quick rendering and then end this. Um, if you go ahead and you set caching on, now let me go ahead and, and turn on the... Um, uh, network debugger. I'm going to look for the word tech that's being loaded. Uh, that should be the any time that I'm going to load the um, uh, the RSS feed. If I go ahead and click apply, and uh, let's go ahead and actually refresh the whole page. I'm probably already storing it in um, local storage. So uh, if I have the um, the caching turned on, what's going to happen? What you actually can see is the feed loaded, but I didn't actually load anything in the uh, uh, in the network tab, but there's nothing actually sent across the wire. So what's happening is that there is a, I'm storing the results in local storage with a timeout, and um, 
uh, it works pretty well. So if I go ahead and I delete this, let's go back to it and let's go ahead and refresh. That's fine. We should now see that we actually had to go pull the RSS feed. I think I'm in store if I refresh it yet again. We'll see now that local storage is actually being used. I didn't have to make another request, so I thought that was super cool. Uh, the last little demo that I want to show on the um, on the editing side, before we quickly flip over the code for just a, a few minutes here, uh, is on the rendering aspect of it. So by default, we're using a React component for rendering. Uh, a lot of things that you can change if you wanted. I even kept in some of Oliver's um, uh, color changing kind of aspects, which uh, I thought was kind of cool. It's just a cool demo for me. I, I don't really like it in general. Like, I don't think this would be a good thing that you would typically want to give your end users. Um, but I thought that was cool. I am using moment.js. So for my European friends, if we wanted to change the date. We could change the date. Uh, date format got changed. Maybe I want to turn some things off. I want to allow more characters. All those work. Uh, but the other really cool thing that I liked was using that handlebar template approach. So by default, there's a template that's enabled for you. If you save that and apply it, um, it gives more of a cardstock. Uh, using all the other little things, the cool things, the PMP um, React controls as well for something like the web part title, uh, using all of that really cool stuff. Cool. So very quick demo. Uh, thought that would be fun to see what the uh, what we're going on, on what we're doing on the front end. If we go ahead and we quickly look on the back end code, um, one of the the major things that I did here was um, I like the idea of moving everything, most of your helpers, most of your controls, your modules, etc., down to the source level so they're more shareable. Uh, totally up to you. Totally understand that you know some people like doing it certain ways. Um, I was able to pretty much modularize out the local storage service. So if you want to just grab that, I think you can. Um, I tried to comment stuff as much as I could as well for you, uh, but I have some um, some interfaces to be able to, to be able to interact with the local storage. Uh, there's a whole RSS reader service as well um, that uh, 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 that allows you to, to be able to, uh, to work with and manipulate the RSS feeder. I created a simple RSS parser as well. I wanted something leaner that I could find online. And um, last but not least, um, there's just the, the general layouts and the general controls. So a lot of fun stuff hopefully you can find in this code. Uh, I would always love to get uh, more feedback. Oh, yeah, the, the client service. Um, what I ended up doing was creating multiple services uh, for t t interacting with different types of RSS feeds. And then um, I had the, but all of them use the same HTTP client. And what they basically do as input is they set up an HTTP client from um, context. And and hopefully AC is uh, cringing a little bit. He always taught me never really just send in the context, uh, your web part context to a module. I did it here for simplicity. Typically, the recommendation would be to, I think the best practice is really to send in only the specific aspects you might need to your sub sub modules, sub controls, et cetera. Um, but for simplicity, I just sent in the entire context, and that allowed me to um, uh, grab the HTTP client that I needed. So thank you all very much. Hope that demo um, gave you a good overview of what we've got there. If you want that URL at all, it's just you know over in that GitHub thing. i huge fan of the idea of creating a better interface for that, so that was presented a few minutes ago. Absolutely agree. That would be really cool to help promote some of the web parts that um, are almost ready for, for um, uh, a live instead of you know, for production rather than just being a demo of, of maybe how to make CRUD requests, which, by the way, that is a cool solution as well. Uh, just probably not something that you would use on a live portal. So thank you all. I will hand that all back to you guys. Great. Thanks, Eric, for a really cool demo of a really cool web part. Appreciate you doing that. Now, I think we're over to Luis. Uh, if you want to go ahead and take over and start sharing. Hi, guys. Some really good stuff from Eric. Hey, we can hear you. Cool. Thank you very much. I'm sharing my screen. <clears throat> so please let me know when you can see it. Nothing yet. It's loading. Now loading. And I got it. Take it away, Luis. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, and as usual, uh, you can find the sample in the um, a, a GitHub SPDFX extension uh, repo. And, well, um, this sample is uh, just a common set that is going to configure uh, your page as a single app part page. 
And well, if you take a look to the uh, official documentation, um, there are like uh, three ways of changing the, um, the layout. You can run some JavaScript in the browser console, which obviously is not great. And then you can use the um, uh, PMP powers of commands or the uh, CLI um, to change the page layout. After all, the only thing that we need is to change the page layout type property of the list item and set it to single web part update. So I thought it would be a good idea to have the option to configure uh, the page from the UI. So I develop an extension um, to that. So uh, let's do a quick demo. Uh, I have created uh, some pages here in my um, modern team site. So let me show you the one with um, an image web part on it. Uh, so as you can see, um, this is the usual layout with the um, page header on here, title, author, and so on. And there's just an image in the um, in the page. So if we jump back to the site pages library and select again the page, uh, we have a new command button on here to single up part. And if we click on it, we are getting, hey, the page is configured as single web part up page. So if now we jump back to the page and we refresh, <coughs> yes, you can see um, you are getting the, the single uh, page up part layout. So the image is taking um, the entire, the entire um, uh, main content in the, in the page, as you can see here. So um, if we take a um, quick look uh, to the source code, um, this is just an SPFX extension, uh, list view command set extension in this case, that we are defining just one uh, command, the button to um, convert, to change the, the page layout. We are using a base64 image on here for the icon. And well, all the magic is actually happening in the uh, command set code. So when the uh, list view is updated, we are just checking if we have uh, only one item uh, selected. And if that's the case, we are showing the button. And when we click the button and the unexecute uh, method fires, um, we are checking is our uh, button. And in this case, from the selected rows, um, we are just getting the name of the of the page, the SPX file name, and we are calling this async function on here with the name. So basically, we just need to do a post request to the REST API, Circle REST API. So in this case, it's get file by URL, name of the page, and the um, the fields of the of the list item. It's a post, so we need to configure some headers. And also in the body, um, we configure the page layout type with this single web per app page value. So we just need to post the request. And in case everything has to work, um, we are going to get a 204 uh, response status. And otherwise, something something went, went wrong. Um, so well, this is. Um, this is the code, and again, um, gives him how, how it works. So that's pretty much uh, everything from my side. Bessa, I think you want to uh, yeah, talk so, about this. So let's, let's talk about that one slightly. Can you go back on the, on the page, and let's pinpoint a few things here. So, so first of all, uh, like, I, like I mentioned on the, uh, on the intro, uh, the, the end behavior in the general availability will be different. So you don't have to programmatically change this behavior. This is the preview experience um, so that people can actually play around with this. The, the key question is what actually Till is asking. Uh, can I get rid of the left navigation? The answer is yes. It, it is part of the page layout. So you can actually change the page layout to be home page layout. Uh, oh, sorry. In the communication sites, you can actually get rid of it. So, um, so it, it is part of the, the rendering logic. Now, right now, we're in a modern team site. So by default, in the modern team site, the left navigation is there. So you can get rid of it. Uh, you can also, uh, nowadays, you can adjust already the header section in here. Um, so uh, 
actually we can we can show that that in here as well. So this is a modern team site right now. Uh, uh, Luis, can you actually? Oh, that's a good point. That is a good point. And then going back on the on the page and voila, we are without uh, the left navigation. So it's it's just a matter of uh, configuration. Uh, well, what are we doing uh, on the page? Now, can you go to the modify uh, the look and feel on the menu? Uh, one thing what I wanted to pinpoint uh, here as well, uh, so on the gears menu, interesting that it's not actually expanding. Well, no, the image is smaller than the screen. So can we go to change the look functionality? And in here, I click header. Not all of the gear, and we can actually click compact, and that's going to reduce then the the SharePoint section on the on the uh, front as well. Now we potentially, if we do now apply, um, well, actually, can can we set uh, the header color to um, purple and then do apply? That gives an idea uh, how it will look like uh, as well. So the the background on the header, yeah, I think we're done, and then the background option. And then let's put that one, the background being purple. Or we could upload an image as well later. Um, the whole point what I'm trying to make here is that now if you click apply, uh, we can see that the SharePoint section in the suite navigation, uh, underneath the suite navigation is getting smaller and smaller. If needed, if you need to have a full scale rendering of the web part. So really having that kind of a, uh, a single part application feeling uh, if you're using this option. Now, there was a question, by the way, uh, which I want to address right away. There was a question related on, can I modify a custom uh, modern master page? Answer is no, because there is no such thing as modern master page. So we're not using uh, master page techniques uh, anymore uh, in SharePoint. Um, we are giving you options on embedding headers and folders and new uh, new placeholders in the, um, which are coming, um, but you cannot modify a custom master page because, um, or the master page itself, or introduce a custom master page because that's not a feature proven way of modifying sites. So we need to have uh, alternative ways of doing this. Um, one thing what I wanted to also pinpoint here uh, is that when, when you're creating, uh, so in the GA, so whenever the 1.8 comes out, when you are actually creating new pages, uh, when you click add a new page, will actually introduce in that selection then all of the web parts which are supporting a single page application rendering. So you're kind of creating automatically then a new page. So you don't have to go through this flipping of the, of the uh, page layout and section uh, in the site. But I think that's pretty much it. Maybe somebody might be still thinking on, hey, so will there be ever never an option to get rid of the header completely, which is now saying the modern team site uh, in this page, uh, which is a fair question uh, because some people would like to get rid of that. Now, it's it's one of those things which are still uh, under discussion. One of the reasons why, it's, why it is there is that if we would get rid of it, um, what would be the SharePoint? So where is then the SharePoint? SharePoint would be completely gone. So the thinking is that it, uh, in our design team is, is thinking that having that header, at least as a small header, header, will make sure that the end user will know that they are actually in a SharePoint and they would not get lost rather than completely getting rid of the, the SharePoint section um, and only leaving suit navigation on the top. So again, debatable. Uh, I would ask that people would uh, give us feedback using the user voice on all of those things um, and that if, if you need to get rid of that and that's a viable thing, um, please use user voice to give votes on that one. Um, there's a question from Kiran, will page layout be supported? Answer is yes, uh, page layouts will be supported. So in the selection and creation of a new page where you can select the, the single part applications, um, there will be a option to also select page layout. So these are not exactly the same page layout as you were having uh, in the classic publishing. They're more page templates. So you're kind of a selecting, uh, you, you're able to save any existing page as a template, and then we're able to see that as an option when you're creating a new page. So it's a starting point for your page. But you won't have a similar kind of a sections and, and uh, editing panels and so on like you had in the classic publishing. So it's a slightly different uh, setup. Uh, up by is asking, by the way, can we get this presentation? Presentation will be uh, provided as a link in the blog post uh, tomorrow uh, when the recording comes out. Uh, and obviously all of the, the uh, 
all of the important and interesting SharePoint uh, dev topics are in the SharePoint dev blog uh, from, uh, uh, and I will add the link here. Um, so we'll have the video recordings there, we'll have the presentation uh, downloadable there as well, so you'll be up to date on that. Um, yes, so the base layouts, the base templates or base layouts, whatever we call them, I think they're, the page template uh, is a more descriptive uh, statement on that one. It is coming. I think we actually potentially demonstrated that in Ignite in one of the sessions. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, I did some verification pretty recently around that capability and, and it's, it's looking quite nice. So you're able to save any existing page as a template or a starting point and then when you create a new page you can select that. Um, and there's a ways of, of getting those provisioned then uh, across multiple site collections at least programmatically. So uh, of course that's coming. Uh, Alberto has a, uh, a question related, what's the difference between web part and extension? Extensions, well, I would recommend going to the, our documentation, which are pretty descriptive, uh, which are also showing examples uh, around uh, what is a web part and what is an exemption, extension. Uh, web parts are configurable by end users, uh, so you can, when you edit the page, extensions are not. Extensions are basically like header or footer of the page and so on. So. Uh, different kind of things. Um, Gautam is asking support for the new footer header capabilities in the BMP provisioning and that is in the pipeline. Uh, right now uh, we are starting to plan the, the next schema version and at that point then the new footer header capabilities and actually also Teams provisioning is planned to be as part of the BMP tenant templating. So you're able to define uh, those footer entries and header settings for the pages at that point. Um, we're still debating that potential. One option is that we'll do a smaller quick release uh, with a smaller template changes and then a larger release with, for example, team support at some point, but we're still debating on that one. Um, and what is the right uh, process of, of releasing those. Jim is asking, we used to have web part zones that laid out the web parts next to each other rather than above and below. That is true right now, not uh, coming at least in the page layouts or page templates. Uh, that might be something which people can actually request uh, using the user voice uh, as well. So I do know we had a vertical support and horizontal support for the web part zones. Now that we are in the in the sections and columns uh, uh, layouting model, uh, we do not have web part zones as such. So it's a slightly different uh, way of, of defining the page uh, in the modern page uh, rather than in the classic page. Any other question? We have two minutes. Uh, would SPFX extension be available? Classic pages like how web parts are answered on is unfortunately no. So theoretically, we could make that happen. Uh, the question is again on prioritization of the uh, of the tasks and issue uh, and uh, over to tasks of all the team. And right now, enabling a classic. Uh, SPFX extension is not in the pipeline uh, to be done by the teams who are prioritizing over the modern experiences. Is that Patrick? Oh, that's somebody else who's causing quite a lot of background. Well, this is a good, good point to jump in and let folks know the next SharePoint Framework JavaScript Special Interest Group meeting will be February 28th. That's in two weeks from today. And the next general dev meeting will be next Thursday, February 21st. So hope you can join us at both of those. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to thank uh, Eric and Luis for doing two awesome demos. Really appreciate those. I really appreciate everybody uh, joining us on the calls, pitching in uh, on everything around the GitHub, across all the projects, and then being part of the larger PNP community. Thank you to all of you. Have a great rest of your day and look forward to talking to you soon. Bye. Bye.